uh, even in Pakistan, apparently. But uh, um, uh, in principle, uh, welcome uh, all to this uh, state, uh, to this ACES meeting on uh, state uh, phobia um, uh, uh, or state phobia, rethinking the state after COVID. Um, uh, um, the idea was to organize uh, this event. It's a bit of a follow up after two, uh, I think, rather successful uh, lectures we organized in the previous year on uh, the topic of state phobia, one with Lee Mitchell and uh, another one, of course, with Chiara and very, various other um, uh, wonderful uh, um, uh, lecturers. And uh, the idea was, of course, that, 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 that the state uh, has been uh, one of the effects of the corona pandemic is, of course, that, that uh, the idea is that. Uh, the state has uh, also un un underwent uh, several metamorphoses. On one hand, you could argue that, uh, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, the state, uh, after it uh, seems many dec decades to be in, the, the, in, the, in retreat, um, and it, after the euphoria of uh, the market, we see certainly the state coming back, at least at what it appeared, uh, becoming uh, re relevant uh, once more, saving companies, one deemed all powerful, and certainly. Um, having a direct impact on, on many of our lives. Uh, on the other hand, of course, and we've all seen the news and, and seen the media, there seems also to be a, no, a new kind of conception uh, uh, of the state as an enemy or the state as a, 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 a kind of hatred for uh, the state seems to be all pervasive now. Uh, um, more, and maybe this is already an effect of a longer development or maybe this is something new. This is something we can uh, discuss uh, um, in this uh, meeting. Um, where this uh, the long-term development of this uh, or, or origin or nature of this uh, what we can term state phobia in the words of uh, uh, Foucault. So uh, rethinking the state, uh, this has been our interest in, in our ACES uh, theme uh, of uh, publics and uh, politics and it, it seemed a good idea to us to organize an event and so-called expert meeting where uh, typical in the spirit of ACES when uh, scholars and researchers from various um, disciplines and various um uh departments uh briefly think about this uh problem and uh, so i'm glad you all accepted uh, my uh invitation you're all from different backgrounds and uh we only have uh, uh different backgrounds uh briefly reflect from their own research on uh, the topic uh to give you uh, only at last minute we have some slight changes in uh, the program uh due to uh, illness or illness related uh, um, absences uh, um, Louisa had a medical illness and uh, could not attend at the uh, last moment but also uh, um, uh, um, Linda Boss and uh, and uh, Evie Steenvoorde where uh, uh, one was ill and the other uh, uh, could not be here due to quarantine measures of uh, family me measures uh, so um, we have a slight change of program and you can find it in the chat Okay, um, well, um, as I uh, asked uh, uh, Professor uh, Anneline de Dijn uh, of Utrecht University, but also a former colleague from the UVA, political science department, uh, writer of a hugely successful uh, book on uh, freedom, and also, of course, uh, which caused uh, quite a, a stir, especially among anarchists, I believe, was it again, or uh, in, in the US, uh, but I thought, uh, and also a book which you've been working on for many years suddenly became, uh, in the center of all media attention, uh, uh, suddenly the concept of freedom became highly uh, politicized and highly topical uh, events. Uh, and, uh, and that's uh, why I thought it would be wonderful to reflect on the topic from your specific uh, background. Uh, if there are no further remarks or questions or uh, preliminaries, I would uh, give the floor to the online floor to Anneli. Thank you so much, uh, Matthijs. Um, I have uh, prepared a very, very short uh, PowerPoint presentation. I hope you can all see it. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm a historian of political thought, as Matthijs mentioned. Um, so that's what I'll talk about today. Um, how and why did state phobia emerge in the history of political thought? Why did people start thinking that the state is a bad thing that you need to fear um, and, and, and roll back? And, um, I'll have uh, less um, uh, to say about, you know, what actual happened in political reality, uh, but I don't think it's uh, controversial to say that um, this uh, ideological aspect um, is important uh, and that anti-state thinking has had an impact on political history. So I'm not going to demonstrate that, but, I, but that is uh, an assumption um, on which I operate. 
and that uh, this that that the development of state phobia has shaped our political institutions uh, to a certain or even a large degree. So the, um, the I want to make two main points. Uh, the first point is that state phobia has uh, quite deep roots in European political thought, and that it dates uh, back um, um, to the. Uh, French Revolution and the reaction against the French Revolution. So it's uh, something that emerged in the early 19th century, uh, mainly among um, thinkers who describe themselves as liberals. Um, so I'll talk about, uh, I'll talk a lot about uh, liberalism. Um, and then the second point I want to make is that we need to understand the emergence of state phobia um, as being linked to the emergence of democracy. So in a sense, um, I want to argue state phobia should be read as democracy phobia. Um, so uh, I'll start um, by um, um, delving a little bit deeper um, in the history of uh, liberalism. Um, so uh, what I um, uh, what I want to argue today or um, is that liberalism, uh, a political movement emerging in the wake of the French Revolution in continental Europe. Um, that is the first movement uh, where you had, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, political thinkers arguing uh, that the state is something that needs to be um, kept in check and it is something uh, dangerous and that if you want to be free, what you need to do is um, limit state power as much as possible. Uh, so the key doctrine of the early liberal movement uh, was a commitment to the minimal state um, and uh, the uh, main slogan, you might argue, of the uh, early liberal movement was laissez-faire, uh, laissez-passe, so uh, let every citizen do uh, what they want and let's not interfere with what citizens do. Now, uh, there's also a considerable debate in the historiography about whether what liberals did in actual practice, so when they came into power in the course of the 19th century, whether that was implementing laissez-faire, uh, but I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not going to um, uh, you know, delve into that debate, whether you can describe what they actually did as laissez-faire, uh, whether they put this ideology into practice or not, this was, you know, this was a very key component of their ideology, state power needs to be limited. Um, just an example to illustrate that. Um, huh. Okay. Uh, so one of the earliest uh, liberal thinkers uh, was a French um, a philosopher uh, named Benjamin Constant. Uh, he was one of the very first uh, political thinkers to describe himself as a liberal. So he self-identified as a liberal. Um, and um, uh, he, you know, coined this famous phrase um, uh, that, you know, what the government needs to do is, uh, is, is you know, encapsulated by the slogan laissez-faire. Um, so this is a quote from his uh, commentary on Filangeri, um, in which he uh, sort of says, well, my main message, my one principle idea without which we will not achieve anything useful or lasting is that the functions of government are negative. What government should do is repress evil and let the good take care of itself. And uh, for, you know, apart from, you know, policing and, and making sure nobody kills each other uh, for everything which has nothing to do with actual crimes, let us therefore cross out the words repress, eradicate, and even direct from the government's dictionary for thought, for education, for industry, the motto of governments ought to be laissez-faire et laissez-passer. Um, and these views uh, were continued to be defended by liberal thinkers throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, so another uh, you know, famous example um, is the work of um, one of the most influential liberal philosophers of the late 19th century, Herbert Spencer. Um, so um, um, his, you know, his writings were translated and read all over the world. Um, and I think the title of his book really neatly summarizes what 19th century liberalism was to a large degree all about, the man versus the state. Um, and one of the ideas that Spencer developed in his book um, was that citizens had a right to ignore the state, for instance, that they should not be able to be compelled to pay taxes. Um, so um, uh, liberals um, uh, were, um, to use the terminology of this um, program, state phobic, uh, but they didn't just go about saying that the state's power should be limited. They also developed 
institutional blueprints that were supposed to guarantee this limitation. And uh, they did so most importantly, uh, they tried to institutionalize their distrust of state power. Um, so the, the most you know, uh, common proposal um, in liberal thought to actually do that um, was to say that uh, what you needed, what government, but that good governments needed to be constitutional government. And by that they meant that um, the constitution should be written um, uh, there should be a list of individual rights, um, you know, listed in these constitutions, and um, courts should be given the power to enforce these rights against state power. Um, and uh, this uh, program was um, implemented, um, um, you know, in its most pure form, you might argue, in the United States, where for quite particular historical reasons, the Supreme Court acquired the power of judicial review, uh, making it in some ways more politically powerful than Congress. And what you see is that throughout the 19th century, the Supreme Court used these powers to protect property rights, in particular, uh, the rights of uh, slave, fl slave owners, um, whereas liberals on the other side of the Atlantic uh, looked on, uh, you know, jealously at this example. Um, for example, in uh, 1848, uh, the Hungarian liberal thinker, uh, Josef Eotfos, um, argued that uh, what Europeans should do is imitate this American example um, uh, by um, yeah, creating a constitutional government with um, a Supreme Court um, and a, a Bill of Rights. Now, all of this is, of course, quite familiar uh, terrain. Um, so what I've just sketched is um, sort of, you know, the... Uh, um, the, the textbook uh, understanding of uh, you know, liberalism as a historical tradition. But what I would like to emphasize, and I think this has not been emphasized sufficiently in the existing literature, um, so that is something that I really um, have tried to show in my own work, is that what triggered the onset of liberal state phobia uh, wasn't necessarily a commitment um, um, to, um, you know, hatred uh, for the state per se, or a fear of the growth of state power per se. But what really triggered uh, the emergence of liberal state for it was a democratization of power. And that is very clear in the writings of somebody like uh, Benjamin Constant. Um, so when he defended the importance of individual rights, um, uh, he made it very clear that what they were supposed to uh, protect people from was um, popular sovereignty. Um, so, for instance, he wrote, when legislation brings an interfering hand to bear on that part of human existence, which is not within the sphere of responsibility, does it matter from what source it comes? Does it matter whether it be the work of a single man or of a nation? And then the answer he gives us is no. Um, so, you know, even if, um, you know, the entire nation wants to infringe upon individual rights, um, such as the right to property, even so, its acts would not be any more mm -hmm. legal. Um, so in Constant's work, it's very clear that this concept of rights was um, uh, individual rights that needed to be protected against the state. Were, they were defined um, in particular as something that Need, you know, you, that would protect individuals against um, a popular sovereignty. Uh, similarly, Herbert Spencer's Man versus the State was written um, specifically uh, in the wake of the passing of the Third Reform Act, which gave, um, which extended the popular vote in Britain. Um, so when, you know, Spencer made his arguments about, you know, people should you know, the state should leave people alone. This was because he was really upset about the democratization of the British political system. So again, when liberals uh, said that they wanted to protect individuals against the state, what they were really saying is that uh, they wanted to protect the rights of individuals against democratic majorities. Mainly, um, as I also tried to show in my book, uh, because they were worried that these democratic majorities would use their power to redistribute wealth and overthrow uh, traditional elites. 
Um, now, this point um, is also true uh, for uh, later manifestations of um, the liberal tradition, um, notably for neoliberalism, um, a doctrine um, that emerged in the wake of World War II or in the context of the Cold War more specifically. And that is a point made uh, by Quinn Slobodian um, in his book, The End of Empire and the Birth of Neoliberalism. Um, so Slobodian here shows very convincingly that neoliberalism was not if, you know, primarily an economic doctrine. It was not about economic efficiency, but it was a political um, doctrine. Um, and uh, what the neoliberalism was all about or is all about is, a, is about protecting the market from democracy. Um, and um, what he also shows is that the uh, neoliberal pro project um, was focused on designing institutions um, that would inoculate capitalism against the threat of uh, democracy. Um, and neoliberals um, um, put a lot of um, uh, energy in um, trying to convince the WTO and the European Union that that is what they uh, should be doing. Um, okay, so I'll uh, round off here, um, um, uh, and uh, you know, again, uh, what I, you know, what I think we can learn from uh, the history of political thought is that uh, uh, state phobia is, um, um, you know, a, a doctrine that has fairly deep roots um, in European political culture. Um, that it, you know, this is um, an idea that is really at the heart of the liberal tradition that emerged in the wake of the French uh, Revolution. Uh, and second, uh, that it is important to see that state phobia emerged to protect individuals, uh, not against state power as such, but rather against the power of democratic majorities to do things like redistributing wealth. And um, I think it's important um, to emphasize this point because in my view, it means that the opposite of state phobia is not state philia, um, as is suggested by the title of this uh, workshop, but rather the opposite, the opposite of state phobia uh, might be um, democracy. Um, so this is um, my conclusion. Um, it's phrased here as a question, but I actually, um, you know, you know it, in my mind, at least, it's, it isn't a question. Um, I think we should read state phobia. There are good reasons to think that we should read state phobia as democracy phobia at first. Um, okay, I'll stop sharing. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Henri, for this uh, very uh, brief, but nonetheless very profound uh, um, uh, brief history of the deep roots of uh, the state phobia. And of course, it all it all begins with the French Revolution and especially the counter revolutionaries. We both heartily uh, agree on that. But also, I think you. Thank you for your suggestion about the democracy phobia, something we can uh, chew on. Um, due to our time constraints, I would like not, uh, perhaps we could, uh, I would uh, this time not uh, allow uh, questions, but let's go to our first round of brief uh, presentations uh, on uh, state phobia from different uh, perspectives. And uh, we have uh, uh, the four, first four speakers are Tarek McConnell uh, from the law faculty, uh, Joseph Kuchtel uh, from uh, philosophy, Mark Tutus from media studies, and Chiara de Cesari from cultural anthropology, who and is also uh, uh, teaches at uh, the European Studies uh, Department. I uh, will refrain now from listing your impressive uh, um, uh, CVs, but uh, let's go to uh, the state uh, phobia uh, problem uh, right away. So, uh, Tarlach, maybe you can, uh, you can take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the floor. Thank you very much for the invitation to this event. Uh, great title, very provocative. That's why you chose it. Um, what I would like to do is in a rather conversational way, try and give you a few um, thoughts uh, about how this uh, topic relates to my own research. Um, so first of all, when I look at the title, I would instinctively position state phobia and state philia at two ends of a spectrum of perspectives on the role of the state. Uh, and uh, along that spectrum, I think there's an awful lot of coloration and different shades of perspective. Having listened to the first speaker, uh, I suppose the, the, the position I would take in, uh, along that spectrum is maybe not, uh, it may be one of a healthy dose of skepticism uh, about the role of the state. Um, and I uh, will do that in the context of European human rights law. 
So state phobia and state philia resonate very loudly in my own research, which centers on freedom of expression, freedom of information, media freedoms, and all other communicative and informational uh, freedoms associated with the increasingly digitized society that we live in. Now, the first remark is that the relationship between the state and the individual right to freedom of expression have always been characterized by tensions, uh, conceptually, legally, and practically. In democratic societies, uh, in particular, uh, Western liberal democracies, the, the right to freedom of expression has usually and historically been styled as a right against the state. So individuals, would be right holders and states would be duty bearers, namely a duty to ensure that uh, a whole range of rights uh, exist. But this broad brush uh, description glosses over the inherent differentiation in the various roles that a state can play when it comes to freedom of expression. On the one hand, the state can and often does play a role in limiting freedom of expression. So by um, uh, adopting laws that st stipulate that certain types of expression do not enjoy protection and may be prohibited or in worst and uh, most extreme cases, criminalized. So these are clear limits to the scope of the right to freedom of ex expression. The other role, um, which is uh, sometimes less appreciated is that the state can enhance the right to freedom of expression. Um, so you could think of positive measures taken by states which would ensure access to the media uh, for particular groups in society or to promote certain types of content in public debate, typically through public service broadcasting, which has a mandate to serve all sections of society. A third but also important role of the state in broader public communicative processes is that of active participation. And we've seen this uh, um, very much since the outbreak of the COVID pandemic. Um, in, for those of you who are Dutch speaking, you, you'll be familiar with Informatie from the rights overhype. And this is seen as uh, authoritative information that pertains to situations, in this case, a, a public health emergency. And it is regarded then as reliable information. So in freedom of expression scholarship, there is rightly a skepticism or a distrust of government when it comes to uh, involvement in communicative processes. And this is because it's very tempting once you're in a seat of power to use the channels that are available to you to put forward your own uh, um, political perspectives. And it's important to distinguish between um, partisan politics uh, in public debate and uh, information that is of legitimate interest to the public, such as uh, information concerning uh, public health. I'm conscious of uh, the clock ticking very quickly. So let me just say that the, um, you know, these tensions between the various roles have been brought into sharp relief by the COVID pandemic. Uh, as the WHO itself has said, the pandemic has come with an in, uh, infodemic where there has been a tsunami of information uh, um, and disinformation, conflicting opinions, incomplete information, uh, evolving evidence, which is difficult to test. This brings huge challenges for the legitimate role of the state in public uh, um, debate. And the state has, uh, in all countries, had to uh, draw on public health communication, risk communication, crisis communication to inform its strategies. Uh, in uh, informing the public and facilitating public debate. But sometimes if disinformation is evidently uh, uh, contrary to the best interests of the state, there may be scope to limit it. And then it's very important to do that in a way that is, uh, first of all, deemed necessary, but also proportionate uh, and effective when it comes to the right to freedom of expression. Um, two concluding thoughts. Um, um, uh, if, if I may. The first is that we can get a lot of guidance from the European Convention on Human Rights and the case law of the European Court of Human Rights when it comes to these issues. The dominant metaphor used by the court is that states not only have a negative obligation not to interfere with the right to freedom of expression, but they also have a positive obligation to ensure that everyone who wishes to contribute to public debate 
is able to do so in a safe way and without fear, and that that participation should be effective. Now, when you're dealing with something as uncertain as uh, COVID uh, and you know the source, the, the origins of COVID, its effects, its spreadability, the effectiveness of vaccines, et cetera, et cetera, truth quickly becomes a fast moving target. And you have to be very careful about how you strike a balance between on the one hand, an open and pluralistic debate about these issues where there is a lot of uncertainty. And on the other hand, the need to limit certain types of expression if they are going to harm, uh, lead to harmful consequences. And my final, so this is the dominant metaphor and the space in which the state has to maneuver, uh, so negative and positive obligations. But I think if we uh, look forward in a purposeful way towards the post-COVID uh, era, as suggested by the title, it's important to have a complementary discussion, not just about state phobia and state uh, philia, but also about platform phobia and platform uh, philia, because in contemporary public debate that primarily takes place online, big tech companies are the makers and shakers of that debate. They can influence access to and the scope of and the details of public debate. They have huge influence, huge responsibility, and I think we need to uh, embrace the multi-stakeholder nature of public debate and not limit ourselves to a discussion of the state uh, role however important it may be. Thank you. Thank you, Tarlas. Uh, 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 now we go to our second speaker, uh, Josef Richter. Professor yeah. Meredith. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, in a certain way, my, my remarks will continue what just was said as the positive role of uh, uh, the role of the state in our discussion. Um, what I'm presenting here is is a, is a small aspect of my, my new book on democracy of emotions, which just appeared uh, in German. Um, so um, I gave it, would have to look it up here. So <clears throat> the title of my remarks is, we are the people, we are the state. The slogan, we are the people, we heard- Joseph, do you want me to share the, the, the PowerPoint or not? Um, I, I don't have a PowerPoint, I just have a text. Okay, okay. Um, but yeah, I sent it to you, that's true, so yeah. No, 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 please go ahead, go ahead. Go. So the slogan, we are the people, was heard in a powerful way for the last time in 1989 when thousands of people were demonstrating against the politics of the German Democratic Republic and finally made the state collapse. Meanwhile, the political context has changed and the slogan has been given a right wing turn, finally through a movement critical about the official politics against the coronavirus pandemic. The slogan dates back to the revolutionary events in Europe in the early 19th century. Its manifest event being, we had that already, the French Revolution, and its intellectual source, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's distinction between volonté de tous, volonté de majorité, and volonté générale. The so-called general will is something that cannot be verified empirically, for example, by numbers. It has an exemplary status, meaning a group of people be it a small one, it could also be a single person, claims to represent what is good for all. In that sense, the present heterogeneous movement of critics of the coronavirus politics agrees in representing a repressed truth that has to be defended, even in a classical right to resistance against the so-called mainstream media and the government, which appears as dictatorship. In that context, the, st the term state phobia indeed makes sense if we take it in its psychological meaning as anxiety disorder. The object of anxiety is 
imagined as extremely dangerous. In contrast to that kind of state phobia, I want to emphasize an opposite position, which crystallized in the past two years in the course of the never ending private and public chats, discussions and debates. It is not a position of state philia, if that means that we look at the representatives of the state and expect them to solve our problems, like children expect their parents or like consumers expect a welfare state to do so. It is a third position. Instead of shouting, we are the people, or we are the ones being cared for, this position happily affirms we are the state. I want to point out that by one aspect, the aspect of freedom. It comes without any surprise that the group of harsh critics takes it as a mere freedom of arbitrariness, willkür Freiheit, as Immanuel Kant has called it. I am free if I can do whatever I want. In contrast, the group of defenders emphasizes three dimensions of freedom. First, the empirical dimension that states that being healthy, i.e. being free from disease, in general, is a condition of practicing the freedom of action and a good life. Secondly, the moral dimension that states that freedom has to go hand in hand with self-legislation, autos nomos, autonomy, and thus responsibility. And finally, the political dimension that recognizes political actions as expression of collective self-determination. It is the political dimension of freedom I am interested in. Accordingly, it is not an alien authority, the state, that imposes its measures on the mass of political subjects and makes them an object of command. The subjects aren't only subjectum in the literal and critically accentuated sense of being subordinated. That meaning can hardly be denied, and it is well known in political philosophy, but the subjects are also all those actors of a certain age who are able to say yes or no. The epidemic evidently has made that true again. Wherever we are, the topic Corona for two years, meanwhile, keeps us busy in our talks. So did you hear that the Secretary of State for Health has warned the public yesterday, dot, dot, dot. Did you listen to the pros and cons in parliament given beyond a party line vote? Dot, dot, dot. Did you watch the talk show on TV some days ago where they discussed about dot, dot, dot. Did you watch the, did you read, sorry, the article in, let's say, The Guardian, where it is said that, and so on and so forth. Once again, it becomes clear that what is called the state in principle is not more than an objectification of the will of the subjects. At least the state as objective authority cannot be separated rigorously from the civil society understood as a freely floating discursive movement. Certainly, the people who live their daily life cannot see themselves as part of the legal, executive, and judicative power of the state. There remains a difference between the state and the people. But the people do not confront themselves to the state as long as there is the well-grounded impression that they form a part of the ongoing discussion and deliberation, as long as they can see that there is a circulation of discourse 
meaning a permanent exchange of subjective experiences, uncertain opinions, and more or less convincing arguments. Of course, this can be denied by making all the participants of that discourse to subordinated subjects, a flock of sheep that does not understand what is really going on. But even such a polemical and vicious claim becomes part of the circulation of discourse. The subjects say no, and thus, against their intention, confirm freedom as collective self-determination. We have to acknowledge that there is a dispute about the right way of getting out of the pandemic. And if it is a real dispute, nobody can claim to be the owner of the truth. We are simply in the midst of a difficult and open experience process. And if we are lucky, a learning process. Finally, that discourse also exposes that there are limits of discourse, points where the arguments bend back, as Wittgenstein says, where it does not make sense any longer to continue the argumentation. This is the moment when a compromise has to be found, or the final decision has to be left to fanatic political circles using mere violence. Thus, what we call a discourse is comprehensive and varied, even polymorphic and proliferating. It is exactly this nature that allows us to say, we are the state. We are practicing collective self-determination and continue the grand experiment of democracy. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Josef. Uh, um, uh, I think we can just go to our uh, next speaker, uh, Mark Tutors of the Media uh, uh, Studies Department, and who was the, uh, actually the person who came up with the whole uh, idea of uh, state phobia in our, uh, in our theme group. So, Mark, uh, please. Thanks, Matthijs. Th uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I, um, I would like to take a slightly different approach. I, um, I would like to kind of present some, very briefly, some like um, empirical work, basically an image um, from some research that I did. <clears throat> and it actually connects to a couple of things that have been said. Um, the whole, um, the, the, the so-called infodemic, uh, actually, last year I was working on a research project with the title infodemic.eu, and so this this research is um, an outcome of that. And um, so I just want to sort of set this up. Like the, the question that intrigued me was um, this phenomenon of what in Germany is referred to as the Querdenken movement, which um, these kind of strange manifestations, anti-lockdown um, protests that brought together strange combinations of people with very quite seemingly quite dif different politics. And um, I actually, um, Quinn Slobodian's name was mentioned earlier. He wrote a nice article where he called it diagonalism, this phenomenon. He was trying to get his head around it. He called it diagonalism. And um, so I, what, what I wanted to try to figure out was what is it that is connecting these people diagonally. And the just to sort of fast forward to the end, I think that one of the things that I found uh, that connected them was a sort of a fantasy, a phobic, a phobic fantasy of the state, but a little bit more specifically of the deep state. Um, so that's what I wanna show you guys. Um, but before I do that, I just very quickly set up where I come from. So I'm in new media and digital culture and I study political subcultures on the internet who use a lot of memes. Um, so that's kind of what my research has been for the past four or five years. And in the last year or so, it's focused on um, conspiracy theories, which I think maybe have some similarity to the, um, the interest around po populism that many researchers, uh, that, um, 
that, 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 many, that many researchers were focused on in the last few years. And there's a kind of a similarity in terms of the um, othering elements of that of those ideologies and the way that they imagine the elite. Um, so now I can give you guys the image that I wanted to explain to you. So um, I'm going to share my screen and I'll keep an eye on the time, Matthias. Do you see a bunch of blobs on your screen? Okay, so I'm gonna explain what this is. So I, um, with the help of a fantastic uh, graduate student in communications, um, Fabio Vota, um, we collected half a million Instagram uh, posts. Instagram is of course an image sharing app. And um, the, uh, something that's interesting about Instagram is that people use a, a lot of hashtags in Instagram when they're making posts. So this is a way that you um, categorize your uh, posts so that you can become part of other conversations. And it's, an, it's what you call an affordance. And it's also something that you'd be familiar with, probably many of you from, from Twitter, but people in Instagram use like tons of hashtags. Like it's not uncommon to have 20 or 30 hashtags on a post. So um, we started with a small list and then we ended up getting all this stuff. Um, and what we were, what you see here is um, the year of 2020, the hashtag um, networks where the, um, the nodes or the words represent the hashtags and their proximity represents uh, how they co-occurred. And then it's split up into three quarters of 2020, we didn't have enough data for the fourth quarter. And what I wanted to see was like, there's this, people talk about conspiracy theories, but you know, what exactly is a conspiracy theory? And how, how could you some, somehow um, analyze that empirically? So what I did is I categorized these hashtags into these kind of narratives, which you see along the bottom of the image. Um, and I, you'll, you'll all be familiar with the QAnon narrative the conspiracy theory that was connected to the Trump movement. And what you can see in these three graphs is that there's this big blue blob at the bottom and that's the, that represents the QAnon movement, which actually was very much a Republican, almost mainstream Republican movement. Um, not really uh, nearly as conspiratorial as you would think, um, much more mainstream. In the top of the graphs, you see all these other colored blobs that are moving around and that appear over the course of the three uh, quarters to come together a little bit. At least that was my interpretation. So I interpreted this as a kind of a con convergence and I saw I, the, the name for this convergence in the top of the graph is called another conspiracy theory called the Great Reset, <clears throat> which is a conspiracy theory that imagines the World Economic Forum as involved in nefarious activities to implement coronavirus so as to make money off of us and basically in, uh, control the population. And it's something that uh, Thierry Baudet likes to talk about at the moment quite a bit. <clears throat> so um, two things that I wanna say, um, because I know I don't have much time. Um, one thing that's quite interesting, I think from the perspective of thinking about um, political, the impact of new media on political action was summarized by um, a communication scholar, Lance Bennett, some years ago <clears throat> in a much cited article, where he said that the, um, one, of the, one of these impacts was that um, there was a movement away from people uh, expressing their affiliation to political movements towards um, what he called connective action, which would be based more on your uh, personal identity and would be expressed by, for example, a hashtag like Me Too or something. And that people would, because they were less affiliated with uh, movements and more connected to their identity, there was also, although he doesn't explore it that much, a tendency to sort of move from one um, of these hashtags to another more rapidly. And this leads to a lot more kind of fluidity um, and churn in, um, in politics, at least as it happens online. Um, and, um, and, but, but what he claimed was that what, what is, so this has been criticized, for example, as clicktivism. It's one of the critiques of this concept. Um, 
But um, one of the things that gets left over from all of this is infrastructure, which is to say the hashtags. So I may move on from one hashtag, but the hashtag remains. And those hashtags can be hijacked by people, <clears throat> but, and that does happen. In fact, it happened with a hashtag in the QAnon world. Um, but they also, you know, maybe to some extent take on a life of their own and they um, sort of, um, the way that people use them like on Instagram by just dumping many hashtags together, you start to see patterns emerge and narratives emerge through this like leftover infrastructure. And so this is what I was trying to see is that is there some kind of emergent pattern of a conspiracy that um, you can track that you can deduce from here. And so I come finally to the point of state phobia. Um, <clears throat> so, um, well, we all know, or at least you may well know that the QAnon movement is a uh, very centrally about the deep state. The deep state is a concept that uh, came out of Turkish politics having to do with the um, presence of the military um, as a kind of an unelected state. And uh, this, this narrative was imported and then developed as the basis of the QAnon conspiracy theory narrative that um, was embraced by Donald Trump and fed, fed into the, uh, the Capitol insurrection. <clears throat> um, there is another kind of narrative in the, and that is on the bottom of these graphs. There's another kind of narrative on the top, which is less explicitly right wing and more um, focused around the critique of what in the, in the anti-globalist movement would be sometimes called the Davos class. Um, this is like the World Economic Forum. Um, and um, what I noticed when I looked through these networks was that there did seem to be like right at the center of these two otherwise quite distinct conspiracy narratives on the bottom, the great, uh, on the bottom QAnon and on the top, the Great Reset. Here you see in the middle there, the deep state as this kind of overlapping, um, what we would call a bridge node in social network analysis. Um, and I found that quite an interesting little detail. I'm not saying it's the only thing that I can zoom in a little bit more, Teresa. <laughs> um, I'm not saying it's the only thing that's going on here. There are many other things that were going on. There's the strange phenomenon of Bill Gates emerging as the um, arch uh, uh, antagonist from nowhere literally from nowhere, it did not exist in the first quarter. Um, but what I found interesting for our purposes was that this imaginary of the deep state seemed to um, be the, seemed to answer the question of what it was that connected these move, these diagonal movements across um, kind of more right-wing forms of conspiracy theory and forms of conspiracy theory that I wouldn't say they're left, but they have some 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 elements of family resemblance to certain kinds of anti-globalization critiques that I was I'm familiar with from the um, from the 90s, um, where the World Economic Forum was one of the main targets, and 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 has once again become one of the main targets in the Great Reset conspiracy theory. I'm sorry if I went over time, Matthias. I'm gonna seed the floor. Yeah. Your, your pictures make it, the graphs make it all uh, uh, wonderfully uh, visual. Uh, so thanks, uh, Mark. Uh, um, I'm sure we have lots of remarks, but I think we'll want to go to our last uh, speaker from the first uh, round. Uh, Chiara Des Cesari, uh, cultural anthropologist, speaking from Italy. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks, Matthijs, for the uh, for the invitation and uh, into this debate, which is uh, uh, very close to a lot of my work at the moment. And thanks for the speakers that are part of the um, uh, the speakers who just spoke before me, uh, because I'm um, I'm really learning quite a lot, particularly uh, from this. Um, uh, uh, so juxtaposition of different approaches to the state. Um, I am a cultural anthropologist uh, uh, in, per my training, but I have been working mostly in cultural studies and now in European studies ever since I got my PhD. But I'm still very much rooted in uh, the anthropological approach to the state, which I'm just gonna uh, quickly uh, discuss at the beginning of my of my intervention just to contextualize the kind of work that I do and how I study 
the topic of uh, state philia and state phobia. Um, the, in political, I mean, sort of cultural political anthropology, uh, there are a couple of uh, sort of, uh, uh, I would say, major uh, 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 threads that run through uh, the, uh, the scholarship that is produced by anthropologists on the topic. One is this focus on, of course, the micro level, on micro politics of governance uh, the, and, and practices of governance. And that basically go back to this idea that was uh, uh, most prominently discussed uh, in anthropology by somebody like Timothy Mitchell and that connects to uh, uh, Joseph's uh, intervention that the state is, is not one thing, uh, is not a monolith, and that actually the dichotomy between state and civil society and this again, uh, this idea of the state as a monolith is being radically questioned. And this is one of the, I would say, basic assumptions of the anthropology of the state. And the other idea is this of uh, uh, the other sort of common themes in the anthropology of the state is this idea of investigating how the state is imagined. So if the state is not one thing, it's very often imagined as such, as this sort of homogeneous monolithic agency uh, which intervenes in our life. And the other sort of, uh, 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 the last uh, characteristic of the anthropology of the state that is gonna, it's very important for what I'm gonna say in a moment, is that there is a tendency in anthropology to look at phenomena, not only uh, uh, from the bottom up, but also from the margins. And the idea of a lot of scholarship is that by looking at so-called state anomalies, exceptional states, uh, I've looked a lot at uh, uh, the case of Palestine, which is not even a state, uh, uh, according to the you know, political science definition. But the idea is that by looking at these marginal cases, uh, uh, the exceptions, uh, you can gain a lot in terms of answering questions uh, about the, uh, you know, uh, sort of macro sociological questions. And uh, uh, my own work with state craft and with the state at the moment uh, is essentially with what one could consider the anti-state, meaning a series of experiments with what I call creative institutionalism experiments by cultural collectives uh, and artist collectives and uh, activist collectives with a strong cultural focus to set up alternative institutions to the state in a set of different case studies in, in different places in the world. Uh, one is Palestine, Italy, uh, uh, sort of the uh, Italian anti-state that go back, goes back to a series of uh, very important intellectual tradition. Many of you might be familiar with that. Autonomy, the workerist movement, and so on and so forth. So um, I will say something about, uh, about the anti-state and the sort of look, for, look at the state from the anti-state to conclude that uh, in the cases that I, I work with, my case studies and the case studies of, uh, of our research group, you can also see, see how both sort of state phobia and state philia coexist. And in the very, uh, if tense coexistence of sort of state phobic in the sense of, I wouldn't call them state phobic, but within these experiments, you see how you have a very important critique of the state coexisting with the attempt to create alternative states and to engage with the formal states to create spaces of autonomy. And I think in this tension, very often sort of in this uh, 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 micro-utopias and alternative organizations, alternative institutions by artists, there is a major debate between uh, the, uh, those who want to collaborate with the state and those who don't want to collaborate the state. So um, there is this, this very often there, that those uh, uh, institutional experiments at the margins of the state are animated by this profound tension about how to relate to the state. And you can clearly see uh, how both a state phobia, but from the left, not the state phobia that uh, 
uh, uh, analyst and Dine was describing in the first intervention that uh, you know the the liberal state liberal and neoliberal state phobia, which I would argue grounds a lot of the contemporary uh, right wing discourse uh, against the the state infringement in citizens' liberties in the context of the pandemic. But this is, of course, is a different kind of state phobia coming from uh, the, uh, the anarchist tradition, of course, and in, in Italy, for example, the workerist movement. Uh, and that uh, is perhaps, uh, I see it, uh, there is a representation of that, for example, in, I'm not sure in places like the Netherlands, but now in Italy, it is quite strong. Uh, it's not the dominant voice in the uh, Novax movement, but it's certainly, uh, uh, which is largely dominated by the, by the right wing and by the liberal state phobia, but it's still a very important uh, a very important, uh, uh, an important component of that protest. But to come back to my, uh, uh, to my case studies, uh, I'm talking about uh, the, uh, the case studies that we looked at in, the, in our Imagine Art project are, again, particularly culture, cultural institutions, such as uh, 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 museums and cultural and community centers, which are being set up by artists and cultural uh, organizers, and they are all collective. And the idea is again to respond to an, a perceived failure by the state to uh, uh, stop the neoliberal encroachment upon you know, the public and the common good, and to produce an alternative publicness. And very often, for example, you might know the case of the uh, Teatro Valle in Italy, which was a an occupation of a space then turned into an experimental space for thinking about the future of not only culture, but also politics. And that it became the first foundation for the common uh, uh, enshrined in Italian law. And again, there you can see how perhaps, and this is my suggestion for, the, for our discussion, we don't take this state phobia, state philia dichotomy for granted in, in our uh, in uh, in our discussion. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Chiara, for once again a wonderful, uh, profound, and, and deep uh, reflection. Like, uh, thank you all for this uh, first uh, round of wonderful perspectives. Uh, I'm glad to have recorded it, so we can all look back on it and and chew on it uh, more. Um, there's a little bit less time for discussion, but that's sort of yeah, think, sorry. No, 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 no. The, the two hours is max. Well, for of course, we should have been to the European Union Institute in Florence in the summer and talk about it for a week. But uh, perhaps is there any remark now? Who wants to connect these various? Uh, papers with various uh, talks with, uh, with a common angle or a common th topic. Otherwise, either the hand will connect it all at the end, I see, um, hopefully. But um, is there so far any? No? OK, maybe it's a little bit. OK, then uh, let's go to our second uh, round. Otherwise, we will not have enough time. Um, Sebastian uh, Teisteman will speak in the second round for symmetry uh, reasons. And that means we will go to the next round of uh, speakers, and we'll start with uh, Niels van Doorn uh, from uh, Media uh, Studies. Uh, I saw your Niels, but now... Yep, uh, here oh, I there, am. Yeah, there you are. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so I am also, like, I'm a colleague of Mark, and I'm in uh, New Media Digital Culture, uh, the program, and I am... Um, Study, I study platforms, uh, particularly platform uh, pl part of the platform economy uh, that focuses on gig uh, platforms and share the sharing economy, the gig economy, uh, but platforms more broadly. Uh, so that's kind of where I uh, um, that's my perspective when broaching the topic of today. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit uh, the upcoming minutes about platform capitalisms, uh, as the platform economy is also often referred to platform capitalisms love. A hate relationship with the state. Um, so let me just present mode here. Um, so I know that for some of you, this is completely superfluous, but I just want to offer some historical context to kind of set the scene for what, what I'll be talking about in the, in the last couple of minutes uh, that I have. Um, first of all, you know, um, oh, well, let me just put this so we see all the full, the full text. So state phobia is, of course, an essential part of the Internet's very origin, right? And if it's origin story, we only have to think about the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, which, which was published 
online in, in 1969, uh, 1996, um, uh, that that declared that you know your rules don't govern us here, uh, um, and 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 kind of stating that cyberspace is, is an exceptional space, and especially also a new frontier where these old rules uh, of of uh, you know the, the meat and flesh world uh, uh, don't apply and cannot apply. Um, so. And of course, at the same time, and that, that's right, right at the at the heart of the ambivalence and the paradox here, uh, the internet is also obviously a product of the U.S. military-industrial complex. So that's there's already a great paradox and irony there, uh, uh, which kind of. Um, which is kind of a constant throughout the developing uh, development of the, the the rest of the internet over the past uh, 30 40 years um, and especially this new frontier imaginary worked really well for business obviously as we've seen over the past well 25 uh, years internet came to, became not just a new frontier uh, for society and for you know for communities uh, um, separate from from state uh, oversight uh, or control but really a new frontier of capital accumulation from right from the 90s e-commerce all the way to web 2.0 in the mid 2000s and, and, and the platform economy that we see now. Uh, so today you see that platform economies still claim uh, just like back in the 90s that these old rules apparently don't apply to them. We are not the incumbent firm or type of uh, industry actor that you think we are, we are a platform, which means that uh, you know these rules, uh, whatever rules for 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 uh, content moderation or rules uh, for taxi industry don't don't apply to us. Uh, so platform exceptionalism is is very much with us today still for the past uh, say ten years, uh, and and we've seen many 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 instances in all kinds of industry uh, of regulatory evasion and regulatory arbitrage. Uh, uh, by platform companies um, uh, who have as their motto, as you probably know, move fast and break things. Or another alternative motto uh, has been, uh, it's better to ask for uh, for forgiveness later than ask for permission in advance. Uh, so that's kind of the, the modus operandi by which they, they operate. Uh, and that really goes all the way back kind of to, uh, um, to, to, the, to, to the origin uh, of, of the, at least the commercial internet. The thing is though, and that's also kind of the transition to, to also to my uh, research and the topic that I really briefly wanted to uh, show you or like show you two examples of is that things have also, also really changed over time. Uh, we've seen this move. So not only with respect to Silicon Valley and the platform economy, but really also uh, with respect to statecraft. So we've seen a uh, transition, say roughly since the early mid 1990s to now to from regulation uh, to governance. Uh, I mean, this is a very complex uh, topic, of course, that many of you probably can talk talk a lot about we don't have i don't have time for it now but let's say there there's a movement from regulate there's been a movement from regulation to governance and towards regulatory entrepreneurship so these platform companies have moved from just really trying to avoid the rules and say that the rules don't apply to them to uh you know what has been termed regulatory entrepreneurship which is getting a seat at the table and actually making changing the rules actively engaging with state level state governance at multiple levels and trying to change the rules through policy through you know policy briefs, working papers, lobbying, uh, astroturfing, many different ways, trying to actually change the rules and make that uh, pre, uh, you know, uh, kind of a predicate of their entire business model. That's what regulatory entrepreneurship is about. And you also see, and that's then the, the link to the next slide, uh, um, at least on the local level with municipal governments, uh, the, the emergence, uh, especially also post COVID or during the COVID pandemic, public private partnerships have emerged. Um, so in all, to end this slide, Silicon Valley is learning how to love the state, but with quote, some quotation marks, uh, now that the state also has learned to love them back. Uh, um, and, and you see that, you know, of course, in the Obama min administration uh, with kind of this uh, revolving door between Silicon Valley and Washington, but you also see it in European Union where, for instance, Nelly Cruz uh, sits on the board of directors at Uber and there's many other examples. So they really, you know, Silicon Valley and, and platform firms and, 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 and governments uh, on many different uh, levels uh, really 
like and love each other. Now, what we've seen, so to continue a bit on the partnership, what we've studied over the past two years is that partner, increasingly we see platforms on a local level uh, emerging or want, positioning themselves, I should say, as partners of local governments during the COVID pandemic. One example that I found in New York, so, so our research is a cross-national comparative study of New York, Amsterdam, and Berlin. And, and when I was in New York, uh, um, I, what, what, what I saw is that DoorDash, which is a uh, food delivery company, or you know, they claim to be in, in the business of delivering uh, over lo a broadly logistics company, but essentially they're right now a food delivery company. They buy a partner with uh, the New York, City, uh, New York City public school system to deliver, as this tweet here says, free meals to hundreds of medically fragile students across the five boroughs to, to help keep them safe and healthy. Now, there were a number of other public-private partnerships like this, uh, where especially delivery companies, delivery platforms uh, formed partnerships partnerships with different uh, uh, local government bodies um, uh, in order to provide them with some level of logistic service or infrastructure uh, to get particular services and goods uh, uh, delivered to uh, uh, oftentimes underserved and fragile uh, uh, community members. Um, and then a lot of those were actually not really um, substantial in any way. There were, there were more kind of gestures, public you know, public relation gestures, if anything. Um, but that was also, the, the point was not that it was, at least in the early stages, very uh, insubstantial and more kind of like a PR uh, um, a campaign, Be, as is illustrated by this quote from someone working at uh, Quorum, which is a public affairs software company at which DoorDash was a client. They say in their report, by, and I find this very interesting and telling, by introducing their policy team, so DoorDash policy team, to many officials, in, in New York City uh, mayor's office and elsewhere for the first time in a moment of support and community relations, DoorDash also expects to be able to more easily have conversations with these officials in the future about the issues their team focuses on outside of coronavirus. In other words, we should see this as kind of a form of investing in good partnership relations so that later on you you can you hope to expect that particular regulatory uh, measures might be scaled back a little bit or you at least have a, a, a seat at the table to discuss how um, you know the government's framework governance framework or regulatory framework can be a bit more congenial to your uh, to your business operations now if we move from New York in, in uh, to Amsterdam this is the second and last example I'll be I'll be the, quickly discussing uh, what we've seen is that Airbnb has launched a uh, a year ago, but kind of relaunched it recently in October of, of last year, uh, the, what they, they call the city portal in Amsterdam to support uh, City Hall. So um, what is the city portal? The city portal uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a software tool uh, that helps, ostensibly helps the, the Amsterdam city administration with the registration of short-term rental apartments, uh, which of course is a, is a, is a, is a big and pol highly politicized deal uh, since we have a, in Amsterdam a short-term rental uh, problem and especially that focuses on Airbnb as a, as a nuisance. Um, that has to be regulated. So, um, uh, and Amsterdam was actually one of the first cities that had types of understandings and partnerships with uh, Airbnb, which Airbnb over the past years has iterated on and now the city portal has been added. Uh, it, it also helps the city to collect taxes from these uh, short-term rentals that are registered. Um, and this is then a quote to kind of, um, um, situate this and to, to provide some short analysis of it as a quote from a recent paper that our platform labor team has uh, recently published. Um, so by integrating municipal tax collection into its platform, Airbnb is also looking to establish a long-term financial relation with these cities because they're, of course, they're trying to launch city portals in other cities as well. And this is a relation that seems high, likely to become more important in light of the COVID pandemic. Now, because this is important, right? It's not just Airbnb who has lost considerably during the COVID pandemic because nobody was traveling. Also Amsterdam in 2020 lost 58%, which is 160 million euros of its income from tourist tax. Um, so that's that's a lot. Amsterdam also needs Airbnb in that regard. Um, and, and it's not just the missing tourist revenues that reinforce Airbnb's value, a proposition to cities. Of course, as you know, with these platforms more generally, the economic empowerment story Airbnb communicates uh, also hinges on valuable data access. They have a ton of data. Uber has a ton of data that they claim at least uh, um, uh, the city, city governments can use for all kinds of insights and, and also to serve their better serve their citizens. And of course, uh, uh, 
most cities have a CTO, a chief technical officer, who is very willing to listen to uh, to these platforms and and, and develop particular uh, again partnerships to develop services uh, for for underserved communities or other communities. Um, so yeah, these are just two examples where we see on a local level that there is definitely a more of a, a state philia, if you will, uh, or at least in the form of part of friendship in the form of partnership uh, uh, happening in the term uh, in, in the realm of the platform economy. So a couple of quick conclusions. Um, therefore, uh, you can see corporate platforms love the state when it is willing to act as a public partner and what we call a boundary resource that can be used to promote the idea of platforms as infrastructure. So, um, and then th that idea has of course been popularized during the pandemics. And this is really a, a, a movement where uh, you see that they they draw on and encroach upon public infrastructures and integrate with public infrastructures in order to expand their own uh, 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 private inter infrastructures. And this is a, a, a movement that we see on many different levels in many different cities and countries. Um, but this, is, this, this has just been one uh, example, for instance, the uh, city portal. Um, Unless we forget, they also love the state, of course, when it provides them with economic support during the pandemic. You know, think of Booking.com or offers financial relief to their struggling independent contractors, all the Uber drivers uh, um, that, that uh, um, the, the CEO of Uber asked for, uh, asked the state, uh, the, the federal state in the US for, for, for assistance. Um, well, at the same time, you know, spending a lot of money on, on court cases and, and developing other types of services. So it makes you wonder. Um, and yet state phobia remains simmering at the same time. And there's the ambivalence again, just below the surface, ready to kick back in full effect once the partner state shows its regulatory phase. And, and you see that, especially on the European level, of course, uh, Tarlach already re referred to it, uh, these major platforms that are on the fire and that are getting fined, enormous fines on the European level. And so this, I think what I would like to input into the uh, potential discussion is that we need to look at so it was just said that, of course, states are not a monolith, but when we talk about the relation between state phobia, state philia, we really need to look at the multi-scalar dimension of that. You know, where does the phobia, the phobia and the philia uh, take place? Because this is a, often a variegated and multi-scalar uh, phenomenon and process. Um, and of course, just kind of as a wink <laughs> to end this uh, short presentation with, don't even talk to them about taxation. Uh, I love this headline from a couple of uh, months ago. Uh, apparently, somebody called it the Champions League of Tax Avoidance. Uber used uh, 50 Dutch shell companies to dodge taxes on nearly 6 billion, that's not million, billion revenue, uh, report says. So there you go. Uh, as long as they stay out of your pocket, the state is their best friend. Uh, that's uh, it for me. Uh, thank you, uh, th thank you, Nils, for this uh, wonderful talk and this suggestion for the scalar um, approach. And of course, this ambivalent feelings of philia and phobia, they often go together. And also in the case of the the the, the, the internet uh, uh, companies. Um, without further ado, um, I would like to go to Mark de Wilde of the from the law faculty. Thank you so much for uh, for inviting me, but also for the wonderful. Uh, talks so far uh, that I'm much enjoying. Um, and my, uh, my remarks will be about uh, emergency power and public trust in the COVID-19 crisis. Um, during the present COVID crisis, we have seen governments across the globe making extensive use of emergency power of states of exception or emergency legislation. And this has led to suspensions of fundamental rights, for instance, the freedom of movement, but also to limitations of democratic control. For instance, in the Netherlands, policy decisions are made now in the Katshuisberaad and they are announced in press conferences and only afterwards parliament is involved. Now, this lack of democratic control has led to a crisis of confidence, to state phobia, to distrust in public institutions, distrust in the state, distrust in the government more specifically, but also in other public institutions such as the media and even science. Now, public trust is crucial for effective responses 
to crisis. Uh, just the other day, uh, a research uh, report came out from a conglomerate of European universities that showed that those societies that uh, have, in which there is a lot of trust, public trust in uh, public institutions, that those states have been most effective in uh, responding to the COVID pandemic, for instance, reaching relatively high levels of vaccination. So there's a challenge here we should overcome state phobia, a lack of trust in public uh, institutions, while sim simultaneously preventing state philia, uh, an increase, a permanent increase of state power and specifically executive power. So my question will be from the perspective of, of legal history. What can we learn from legal history about these issues? Now, in the past, uses of emergency power have often led to constitutional changes, changes of the structure of the state. Um, often these um, uh, situations in which uh, emergency powers were used for longer periods of time led to a permanent increase of executive power. And the example of the Weimar Republic is only the most dramatic example of this where uh, basically, emergency power was used to um, undermine uh, the parliamentary democracy and to, to enable a transition towards a more authoritarian regime. Um, so there is a risk that emergency power is turned against the very constitution that it was established to defend. And that risk exists especially under two conditions. If emergency power is used for an extended period of time, not for days or weeks, but for uh, months or even years, and if it is used for other purposes than the crisis itself, for instance, to solve political conflicts with non-democratic means, uh, then there is a risk that the, uh, the, the, the constitution is undermined. Now, I would suggest that that risk also exists today. We have seen in the Netherlands, for instance, but the same is true of other countries. But in the Netherlands, we have seen multiple extensions of the temporary statute measures COVID-19, which is the statute that forms the legal basis for emergency measures uh, in the COVID crisis. It has been extended again and again. Now, it, the last extension is to the summer, to next summer. And we have also seen that, the, that emergency powers have been used to prevent democratic contestation. And I think the most problematic example here is the prohibition of demonstrations, demonstrations uh, of people who were protesting against uh, governmental uh, COVID measures and that those demonstrations have been uh, prohibited because the protesters could not uh, maintain one and a half meter distance. Um, now, going back to the past, in the past, jurists, and I would say generations of jurists, have developed constraints, legal constraints on emergency power, both formal constraints and informal constraints uh, that were meant to prevent abuses of emergency power. The most important formal constraints were uh, a maximum term. So traditionally, emergency powers were granted for a maximum term, and that was traditionally six months. Also, a formal constraint is that uh, self-grants of emergency power were prohibited. So those invested with emergency powers could not grant these powers to themselves, but they needed others to grant these powers to them. And if these powers were extended, then they needed the co cooperation of other institutions. So self-grants were prohibited. Apart from these formal constraints, there were important informal constraints. And I think the most important one was, um, uh, most important uh, informal constraint uh, was called in the tradition, the fides publica in Latin, or if we translate it, um, the norm of public trust or public good faith. So those who were invested with emergency powers 
were required to demonstrate their public trust. And that meant specifically that they were not allowed to use their emergency powers beyond the crisis that had justified these powers. It also meant that they could only use these powers to combat the crisis, but not for other purposes, for instance, for political gain. And finally, it required those invested with emergency power to demonstrate their constitutional fidelity or what the Germans called Verfassungstreue. So they had to show that they remained faithful to the spirit of the existing constitution. For instance, by taking only temporary measures that could be undone after the crisis had passed, but no permanent legislation. Now, this brings me to my conclusion. I think we can only overcome state phobia, that is distrust in public institutions, and prevent state philia, that is permanent increases of executive power, by cultivating public trust, by requiring those in power to demonstrate their public trust as a constraint on their emergency power. For instance, by requiring them to show constitutional fidelity uh, and that they do not use these powers for other purposes than combating the crisis. Uh, I saw some of you were not moving, so maybe um, uh, the internet connection did not work. If that is- Oh, it did, it did, it did. No, it did. They, I think they were just uh, uh, enthralled by your, by your narrative. <laughs> okay. They, they're just... Now, thank you for this uh, philosophical uh, perspective and uh, legal philosophical uh, perspective. Uh, um, again, uh, thank you for all these wonderful talks and uh, the, the, each merits a long discussion, but it's not, well, it's not the, the Zoom format. Uh, um, I think we have to go to our uh, next uh, speaker from this wonderful uh, lineup uh, of uh, great, um, and Alessandro Nai from the Communication Science uh, Department. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, that's my pleasure. Thanks for, for the invitation and, for, and to ACES for organizing this. I'm going to share my slides. I hope you can see them. Yeah, that should be the case. Um, so me, thanks again for the invitation. It is really wonderful to be part of such a diverse panel. Um, very refreshing also to see all these different approaches, some of whom are very far from my current uh, sort of uh, focus in research. Um, but, but also to see the different approaches converge into, into stuff that we, all, uh, that we all investigate and discuss. I, I am technically, not technically, formally in the Department of Communication, but um, I tend to work most on the intersection point between communication science and political psychology, and is more a political psychology um, approach that I would like to put on the table today as a complement to many things that have been discussed already um, up to now. Um, I would say that the starting point and, and what maybe um, sort of adds uh, a slightly different perspective to what has been discussed so far is not to, to sort of consider what the state is, uh, but who the state is. And this is how the a, a political psychology perspective can, um, can add a new element um, to the investigation of state dynamics, so dynamics at the state level. More specifically, I would like to focus in my very short presentation on uh, dynamics of political leaders, and even more specifically on dynamics of the personality, the character, the persona of these political leaders, and how this persona, character, personality ties directly or indirectly into how they handled uh, the coronavirus crisis. So uh, we could, of course, have like a, a full two, three hour session about whether or not it matters to investigate political leaders per se as, a, as an object of study. Uh, before starting, I would simply like to to suggest that considering the state also through an investigation of who embodies the state in terms of political leaders um, matters because of course when it comes to specific policies leaders tend to especially if they have high executive powers to be able to drive to a certain extent policy that the state will then implement and if this is the case, then in the eyes of the public leaders embody the state. I think we all more or less agree that today, if we think of, of the French state, if we think of Macron, there is a high chance that the, the, the large part of the public sort of overlap the two in their mind. Uh, the same could be said for Biden in the US and so forth. So thinking about the state and thinking about the leaders that steer the states sort of goes hand in hand. And that's sort of also one of my conclusions today, will be one of my conclusions today. Um, if we agree that, that leaders 
or focusing on political leaders matters also when it comes to dealing um, with issues about trust in the state, um, effect towards the state, and in this very specific case, how the state um, handled um, the crisis we are still in. Um, then then um, the question becomes, to what extent different types of leaders handled the crisis that we are facing differently and whether or not, and, and this is my contribution, whether or not we can say something empirical about this, whether or not we can provide objective to a certain extent um, data and evidence that substantiate the fact that different leaders or to be more specific leaders with different characters acted differently to tackle the crisis. And if you can prove that different leaders tackled the crisis differently, then maybe we can add another example or, or an, another piece to the puzzle um, uh, regarding whether the public or how the public sees the crisis in terms of affect positive and negative towards the state or state philia and state phobia. Uh, so in, in other terms, especially uh, within the framework of um, the rise of a certain breed of leaders um, across the world, most notably leaders that have what can be qualified as a more controversial character. Um, we, we can think very easily of examples in this sense, from Donald Trump to, to the Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, Duterte in the Philippines and, and many others. So within the framework of the rise of these political leaders that predates, but also now coincides with the, with the COVID crisis, the question that I think needs to be asked from a comparative standpoint is to what extent leaders and those leaders more specifically uh, handled the coronavirus crisis differently. Now, this is the starting point. From an empirical standpoint, investigating the dynamics of the character or the personality of, uh, of leaders is, is not easy. Uh, we, we could discuss uh, more specifically about how to do this, both conceptually and empirically. I hope we will have time for, for some Q&A afterwards. But broadly speaking, if we, if we inject a political psychology framework within the comparative research on the character of leaders, um, a certain stream of research to which I'm contributing a bit uh, tends to um, sort of summarize the profile of leaders in terms of broad known traits that are associated with human personality. Um, without going too much into details, one of the sort of more widespread classifications of human personality or the, or the character of human beings, of, of me and you or us, uh, is, is, is the big five um, inventory, which broadly speaking identifies five um, axes of personality that you have there, extraversion, openness, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and emotional stability. Um, which broadly speaking summarize who we are deep down. And um, the idea of comparative leader research that uh, uh, addresses or sort of adopts this approach is to say, we can probably also classify political leaders according to this psychological framework. In other terms, we can try to come up with empirical evidence uh, to assign scores on this different personality traits to political figures, existing political leaders. And then once we do that, and we do do that, we can then map and match these uh, personality profiles with what they do in other terms, or more specifically today, um, with the, the response to the coronavirus crisis. So I'm going to very briefly present some preliminary data in this sense that come from a large scale uh, expert survey that we have been conducting since 2016. Uh, is, is a large scale in, in, the, in, in really in the broad sense. Um, so far, more than 2,000 scholars have participated for more than 100 countries, 150 elections. Um, currently, we are gathering data for the election that just happened a couple of days ago in, in Portugal. So the data set is also growing. Uh, you have their geographical coverage of the data that I'm presenting today. Through this expert survey, we, um, we are able to obtain a relatively objective measure of the personality, the character of political leaders. I'm happy to answer more questions um, uh, about how empirically we, we can do this. To give you just an example, we have here, from a comparative uh, standpoint, the personality profile in our data of, of two political leaders, uh, Donald Trump in uh, orange and Angela Merkel in, in, in green. And, and you can see that this personality profile quantified along existing psychological inventories sort of makes sense with the ideas of these two leaders 
that we that, that we all I believe share. You can see, for instance, Donald Trump very high in the bombastic component of his sort of brashness, but but relatively low in everything related to stability, low emotional stability, low conscientiousness, low agreeableness. Whereas Angela Merkel much higher in 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 in, in, stabi- in psychological stability, conscientious, stable, um, averagely plus agreeable, but very low in extraversion. Right? It's a shy person. Yeah. Um, the contrast between these two um, is, I think, indicative of a broader contrast between two types of leaders, um, mainstream leaders, or yeah, and populist leaders which of course are at, at the heart of the current narrative when it comes to the dynamics uh, of, uh, of state phobia. As you can see, populist leaders in red in this graph tend to, to a much lesser extent, tend to reflect the, the, the profile of Trump, so higher in extraversion, more bombastic than mainstream uh, leaders, uh, but also slightly less um, stable, so less agreeable, um, less conscientious, and, and less also stable when it comes to emotionality. Um, so the question is, if, if, if we believe in this characterization of political leaders, and if in the back of our mind, we could assume that who the leaders are drive the, the, the responses to the coronavirus crisis, uh, then a question that basically stems directly from this is, can we pinpoint to personality effects to individual differences of political leaders when it comes to their character, when it comes to the response that they had in the coronavirus crisis. Now, to answer this question, we just need to match this data with data that quantifies, that quantifies, sorry, we'll get back to that in a sec, that quantifies the answer to the coronavirus crisis. As, and, and I'm sure you know already this data set collected by Oxford uh, is the Oxford tracing um, that basically on a daily basis across all countries in the world, tries to quantify uh, the stringency, the intensity of the response that each state implemented during the coronavirus crisis. You can see the red line here is the average response. This is, if I'm not mistaken, are the five or six first months of 2020. So the the real onset of the coronavirus pandemic, each line is a country. And you can see that some country intervened earlier, some country intervened later, some country intervened earlier, but on 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 sort of more weakly, some some countries later, but strongly. So does the personality of the leader of the country in this moment explains whether the state intervened early or late and weakly or strongly when it comes to the coronavirus uh, response? And the answer is, yes, we can find uh, we can find evidence that uh, the, the personality of leaders does affect this. And this is my last slide. I will conclude after this. Um, you have here the results in, in simplified graphical form of two models. Um, the, the top model estimates uh, the magnitude of the intervention. So in the graph that you saw before, how high up the, the, the response went. So how, how muscular was the response? Like all things considered, uh, concerning lockdowns, interventions, and so forth, how muscular it was. The bottom graph um, investigates the horizontal axis. So how quick the response was, right? So these two dimensions, how quick and now and how strong. Uh, the drivers of these two components of the response are the first two lines, the, the personality profile. Stability is, think more like Merkel, high conscientiousness, high agreeableness, high emotional stability, whereas plasticity is mostly the Donald Trump style, right? Bombastic, extroverted, impulsive kind of thing, right? plus a series of control, including the populist character or not, and controls at the country level and so forth. What do we see? Well, perhaps counterintuitively, we see that when it comes to the magnitude of the answer, plasticity has a significant positive effect. In other terms, impulsive, bombastic, brash leaders were more likely to intervene in a more muscular way stability, more conscientious leaders were not likely to intervene more or less strongly. You can see that the effect is very weak and by far not statistically significant. At the same time, thinking not in terms of intensity, but in terms of the, 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 the speedness of the response, the promptness of the response, we can see again that plasticity has a positive effect. Um, what the, the, the model estimates there is the number of days at the lowest level. So um, more plastic, um, bombastic, extroverted leader intervened more quickly. So as a conclusion, and perhaps counter-intuitive, counter-in- 
intuitively, sorry, in the populism per se has no effect. Surprisingly, stability also has no effect. Surprisingly, even more so, uh, is the fact that positive effects on dealing with the corona crisis in terms of magnitude and promptness uh, are associated with, with plasticity, so with more bombastic leaders. Um, so is it the case that more bold leaders that tend also to have this sort of more controversial character acted maybe more impulsively but more decisively? Are stable leaders less effective to tackle the crisis? And I think this is a key question when it comes to then the perception then, that, we, that we bring back to the state in terms of we like, we dislike the concrete actions of the state. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Alessandro. Alessandro, for another uh, very fascinating perspective of uh, political psychology. I never thought about it in this way. We have two more regular talks, and then uh, hopefully uh, either the hand will tie it up uh, together. Um, uh, now we move on to Teresa Kuhn of Political Science uh, Department. Thank you very much, uh, first of all, for uh, organizing this and also uh, for the talks that were before. Um, I think it's super interesting to see um, how across disciplines we tackle the same question in very different ways. And uh, if you've seen me moving around a lot, it was sometimes because I was taking notes or even actually changing my presentation uh, because I thought, oh, that really relates to what such and such just said. So it's been really a pleasure. Um, let me first share my screen. I have also a PowerPoint presentation. I want to start with the, um, yeah. Um, here you go. I hope everybody can see it. So um, my presentation is slightly different to the other ones in two ways. First of all, I'm addressing mainly not state phobia, but actually Euroscepticism, um, so phobia of the EU, so to speak. Um, as you will see in the presentation, uh, we think in this research project that it is actually intrinsically linked to what people think of their national democracies, of their national leaders. So there is a very close link to it. Um, also because um, if you are critical of your national states, then there are basically two ways. Some people think, okay, then let's move to the EU or to the European level that could solve some of the national problems or others see the EU more as an extension of their national states. Um, and sometimes because of that become also automatically European uh, Euroskeptic. So these are two, um, yeah, um, in a way, um, competing arguments and we are here more in in the line of the first ones that we actually see um, the EU as some kind of way out of national problems or the national um, level as a way out of European problems but I'll discuss this in more detail in a second. My presentation is also different in another way in that uh, it is actually um, I'm just going to present a framework, a theoretical framework for a new research project where we just got the funding uh, from the um, Volkswagen Foundation. And the project itself started really this month. Um, I also would like to say that um, um, Lisa Helbig, who's also here today in one of the Zoom rooms, um, she just started out as a PhD uh, student um, at the University of Amsterdam. and um, the Deutschland Institute, and she has previously also already worked for one and a half years on a research project on public support for Corona regulation, Corona rules in Germany. So I think she's really an expert also on the field. Um, I'm just now going to present uh, the, the framework of our um, project. Um, and here we start with um, the question of, yeah, or with um, the argument that uh, COVID-19 really represented a fundamental cha challenge to the European Union. Of course, the EU has been kind of used to having challenges in the last couple of years or decades. Uh, we've seen a lot of um, big crises, but we say that uh, the, this is really a fundamental one in the way that it challenges in a way that the some of the fundamental principles of the EU. 
So we have seen, and uh, you see here, for example, a picture of a Dutch uh, Paris conference, uh, press conference. We see very similar pictures all over Europe and all other countries as well. So people have gotten really used to uh, weekly updates from their national executives. So there has been really a strong presence and strong dominance of national executives in the last two years, and especially in the very first months of the corona pandemic. Uh, and this has really pushed the EU a little bit back into the sidelines. Um, but not only that, it has also these national executives, they have taken um, uh, interventions that really challenge what the EU is standing for. So um, especially in the first months of the Corona crisis, countries and member states more or less individually decided to, to close down their borders. Um, this, of course, is very much in conflict with the EU's principle and ideal in a way of free movement. We've also seen that um, um, there was very big reluctance in the first months to show solidarity towards other member states. You might still remember when Italy asked um, other member states for help, um, not only financial, but in the beginning, really just in terms of PPE material, etc. And nobody was there to help. And then China stepped in. Um, so here, solidarity, which is also one of the you know big principles of the EU, at least um, at least rhetorically, has highly been uh, questioned here. And uh, as was already highlighted by one of the previous talks, um, many or some governments really took quite drastic steps to reduce um, the freedom or to actually extend their own rights. And therefore there have been quite some challenges to the rule of law, um, especially in, in countries such uh, as Hungary and Poland, which um, also yeah, really pose a big problem to the EU with respect to how uh, the EU as such should react to it. So um, these are the, the, yeah, at least three big principles that are, have been challenged. And uh, we ask therefore in this project, um, how has the pandemic uh, shaped public support towards the EU? And there we look in particular towards Eurosceptic attitudes of the public. So whether people are pro or anti-EU, uh, whether they support Eurosceptic parties, whether that has actually gone up or down and whether they are willing to show and exert solidarity with other member states. So these are basically the three outcome variables, the three main aspects that we want to look at. And um, we um, have developed in, in this uh, project a new theory on how the citizens look um, at, uh, public, uh, um, at the EU. And here we take... Um, um, the benchmarking theory that has been developed by Katharina de Vries and others, where we say, okay, um, the, when thinking about the EU and when taking their, uh, making their judgments about the European Union, individuals look at basically how the EU is performing with their own country um, or with other countries um, and take um, their decision on that. So one example is the success of the UK vaccine rollout. Um, more or less a year ago, where uh, the Bild site on the German biggest tablet newspaper had this, uh, um, this slogan, Dear Brits, we benighed in you, so we are jealous of you, because uh, the UK had gone it on itself, had not gone, I mean, of course, obviously it was not part of it anymore, but it had really just done an individual approach to buying vaccines, whereas uh, the rest of the, whereas the EU member states had all tried to do it together, and that had not, in, at least in the first months of, um, of the rollout, not worked very well. So there was this idea, oh, maybe we should have just gone like uh, the UK, maybe Brexit was not even such a bad idea, it actually had some advantages because in in you know emergency situations such as uh, this pandemic, uh, you're better off just doing your own thing instead of trying to coordinate with the rest of the EU. Uh, the UK had a very nice uh, reply to that, or the Sun, one of the tablets there, they they just wrote, we do not envy you, wir beneiden dich nicht, 
over the EU vaccine shambles. So this is one example where we think that these are things where people, you know, they look at the performance from their own country or individual countries and uh, performance of the EU and then take a decision on what they should think of the EU. This is, of course, um, very much rational choice. Um, and you might think um, this is a bit too simplistic. We also think so. We actually have a, a second step in there. And this is like, of course, uh, individuals don't, you know, make these decisions just uh, individually. Um, but um, actually, sorry, um, um, they do uh, look at what to um you know, policymakers, political actors, and the media, you know, these are basically the, the, the three intervening aspects that that shape the responses or shape people's ideas on, on the EU. So um, examples, just as in the last presentation, how are, um, you know, Merkel and others actually reacting themselves? How do they uh, react to EU policies? Um, how do they frame them? And especially then also media. And here we're not only looking at the at the main thing at the um, um, at the um, big media, but also at social media and uh, um, fake news. So um, since we're short on time, I'm just going to skip the part on how we're all going to do this. We're going to do a lot of empirical research, both in survey and field experiments, and just um, say also why, what do we want to get out of it? We want to develop a more uh, theory on what drives political support. Um, and we also want to really focus on uh, the role of communication and misinformation in this uh, uh, in this aspect. And we hope to provide some policy recommendations on how the EU should deal with future crises. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, uh, I hope to next time be able to pro provide some results uh, for all of you. Uh, thank you. Just thank you, Teresa, for shorting this presentation. And uh, yes, we're running towards uh, the end. And I said, I'm very sorry that we cannot have more time to to, to talk amongst ourselves, but uh, uh, um, well, that's sort of the, the two hours is, I think, maximum for a Zoom uh, meeting, at least it is for me. We have two more. Uh, uh, last presentation by Sebastian Thuisteman, who's working also for the UVA Political Science Department, but is also a historian as well. Uh, um, uh, and, and we're going slowly back to the early 19th century here um, and a political uh, philosopher as well. So Sebastian, you have the floor and then Ido has the last word. And mute. Okay, thanks for the invitation and for the introduction, uh, Matthijs. Um, yeah, I think um, I would like to make more systematic point. Um, um, and uh, uh, so my uh, hunch or my idea or my uh, statement is that both uh, uh, the high distrust of the state, but also the need for a strong state, uh, they can both be explained by reference of um, the reference to uh, the political system of liberalism. Uh, so I would like to make some kind of a systematic account uh, and the underlying ideas that our political system, uh, our political order has become more and more liberal in a certain way and state distrust uh, and state hatred, but also the need for a strong state. They're sort of the logical consequence of this. They're logical manifestations. Of, of course, there are also other explanations for understanding this, but I think it's crucial also to focus on liberalism itself. Uh, so in that sense, I think this ties in with um, uh, the first presentation, and I think also with things uh, Professor Fruchtel has been saying. Uh, the background of my talk, and I will try to keep it short, I do have three slides, uh, is that I have been writing an interpretation or reinterpretation of Hegel's political philosophy, which I read as a logic of political order, and part of this logic is sort of the inner weakness and the inner tensions of a liberal order. Um, it's quite a long argument, so I had some difficulties sort of comprising it, but I will try to do my best to give a little bit the sort of the underlying ID. And the key issue is that in a liberal order, the state sort of by definition or logically is always doing both too much and too little. Uh, and I think that's an argument which can be found in Hegel. And I think that's still a very relevant argument. I think that explains a lot of the difficulty of the state uh, nowadays, uh, both needing the state and also uh, seeing the state as a, as a danger. 
in order to explain this a little bit more, um, I want to say a little bit about the way I understand the liberal order. I think crucial for what I understand the liberal order, liberal political order, is that society is conceived as a space of interaction of autonomous individuals. And I think this notion of space is important. Eh? So it's an idea of society which makes very little um, claims about how those individuals relate to each other. It's sort of a space in which they interact. So it's quite limited. So it rejects a more, um, a, a more um, a organic notion of uh, the idea of a political body, in which there's this strong relation between individuals and the state. And I think that's something liberalism rejects. At the same time, and that's a little bit uh, in contradiction to that there is in, liber in the liberal idea of political order, quite often the quite of a quasi, what I call a quasi-organistic idea of natural order and progress. So the idea is that in this space, if individuals you know, have rights and they pursue their ends, mm -hmm. then it also has positive consequences for all. Of course, this is the idea of an invisible hand, more economic mm -hmm. argument, but I think it also applies to more left-wing liberals who think you know the moment you give individuals more rights they will start to cooperate they will use their rights well uh, so it improves society as a whole so there's a certain optimism also in uh, uh, in this liberal idea of um, uh, the liberal notion of political order um, the other thing is that the state is conceived as something external something standing outside of society or instrument of society to, pr to promote and to safeguard individual rights and individual interests. Uh, on the one hand, there's this need for the, for the state. Uh, uh, so again, certain ambiguity at, this, at, at the one end, the idea of sort of a natural harmony. At the other hand, also the need to protect states to enable individual autonomy. So, this, so there's a, yeah, something a little bit double, I think, which is intrinsic in the way I see the liberal idea of order. Um, and which is very much in line with Anna Lind's uh, uh, talk, also the danger of the state of violating the rights and interests of citizens. So there's this ambiguity on the one hand, really needing the state to intervene uh, and to safeguard autonomy, but at the same time, this state is also the main threat to individual uh, autonomy. So there's a certain duality. Okay. Uh, well, how does this lead to a state always doing both too much and too little? Uh, well, the idea is that, well, this notion of a sort of a natural harmony in, uh, uh, in reality is not met. Uh, so, and I cannot go into the details of this argument, but uh, this idea of individuals with rights that they somehow realize autonomy never succeeds because individuals are also in kind of well, competition with each other. Uh, uh, um, so there's always this desire for the state to solve this problem. That's the only institution which can solve this. This is the institution which is supposed to make it possible, the realization. So always as a consequence, well, it's, it's mainly an economic consequence, but there's always this need for the state to intervene. So that's, that's what I say is part of this liberal notion of order. But at the same time, and that's part to the sort of the differentiation of society because of individual rights leads to competition, it leads to different groups, it leads to different positions in society. This intervention always violates the rights and the interests of other groups. So the state is also seen as, uh, as a violation of, uh, of the rights of individuals. And the problem of a liberal order is that these two perspectives cannot, cannot be overcome. Um, uh, it's sort of impossible to find out some kind of compromise which sort of combines it some kinds of optimism. Um, so government cannot work out a stable notion of the common good. Uh, and that's exactly because society is conceived and structured as a kind of space. Um, um, and I think that's sort of the Hegelian argument, which I think is still interesting at least, and perhaps even relevant. Uh, we have to think about sort of the inner interdependence of society. Uh, at the moment, there's a stronger vision of this inter interdependence. There's also a kind of inter unity, a unity which always comprises of inner tensions. Or it's it's a unity uh, uh, together with uh, with difference. It's never it's never a clear unity, but it needs a certain idea of society as a well more organic notion of the state. And then it's possible sort of to point out the kind of 
common good or universal, which is underneath the particularities. And now in this notion of a space, there are only the particularities and it's impossible to find out a common good, which is good for all. Um, so it's an impossibility for the state that also relates to the position of citizens, the way they are trained in this liberal, or they understand themselves in this liberal, um, uh, in the liberal order. Uh, and um, they recognize the legitimacy of the state only insofar as they can relate whatever the state is doing to their own rights, to their interests and to their needs. Uh, the thing is individuals in a liberal order have no kind of internal relation to the state. And I think that's something which Josef Fruchtel was um, referring to when he said, we are the state. Uh, and if you take this notion of liberal order, if you well, take it, um, um, if you take it uh, rigorously, that's in a way that's impossible for in the, So the state has this instrumental meaning. Uh, um, and also other citizens, uh, had, they, they, they're not citizens which together are belong to something bigger. They're seen as other individuals, just as I'm an individual. So that makes it really hard to, to, to recognize the state which claims to intervene for the common good. So that's a fundamental problem in, um, uh, in democracy. I have not discussed democracy. That's, of course, also an important issue. Sebastian, Sebastian, I have to rudely interrupt you. Uh, I'm, I'm yes, very sorry. Maybe we can, uh, as, well, we know each other a long term, so that's why I, I dare to do this. But uh, uh, that, that maybe uh, because we were almost closing towards the end, and maybe do you mind if you give the floor to... to no, no, uh, problem at all. no problem at all. You know, as I said, uh, and, uh, we, we'll be talking about, uh, we'll be continuing this project in other ways, but... Uh, I think, uh, as I said, uh, I think it's time to give the floor. It's very, these wonderful different perspectives and it's very hard for me to give some common remarks, but if anybody can do it, it is no doubt um, uh, my old uh, uh, Dr. Vater, um, Ido de Haan, so uh, Ido. Yes, well, um, thank you, Matthijs, for this uh, absolutely- you Stop sharing, uh, Sebastian. Oh, sorry, okay. yes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for this um, impossible uh, assignment. Um, uh, um, there are a, a, a seminar packed with presentations, a very uh, complicated topic, and then three minutes or so to um, to. We can go make three something minutes out. over time. Uh, don't worry. Can it go a bit over time? Okay, so let, let um, so. Oh, what I, I will not go into each of these separate uh, contributions, but I will I will try to make two more general remarks um, about the, the theme of state phobia and state philia. Um, and the first is um, that we might want to think a bit more about uh, this topic from the perspective of the, the theory and history of uh, emotions um, in the sense that um, uh, we're talking about um, um, uh, love, and, uh, love and fear or perhaps love and hate um, uh, but um, we might want to consider that these, uh, these emotions um, can be um, uh, understood in two different dimensions. If you, if you talk about this in a, in a vertical dimension, then you talked about the state as, first of all, an authority, and there are all, all kinds of metaphors about the authority of the state in terms of the father. Um, the father to whom uh, you subject yourself or uh, the father to whom uh, you uh, obey when you accept his authority but you can also of course um, resist and undermine and even perhaps kill your father so that's one uh, um, had a vertical dimension of the ways in which people can relate to the state but there's also horizontal as she fight batter's name um, in the screen I'm not sure why but um, I fight. Um, um, uh, there's also a, a horizontal understanding of um, love and fear and hate in which you see the state um, as your partner, um, maybe even your lover, uh, as an institution that you can either embrace or perhaps seduce or maybe mislead or use and abuse, of course, in abusive relationships. Um, but the important thing here is, of course, that um, um, state philia and state phobia are 
kinds of relations that are always interconnected. And these are modes of identification and modes of disidentification with a certain institution. And I think that this effective dimension of state phobia and state fear, and it needs to be taken into account. Um, the second remark that I want to make um, relates to the issue of um, the genealogy and also the conceptualization of state folk and state filia, and it leads back to the opening statement of uh, Annaline, but also to many of the things that have been said in the uh, presentations. And that is that um, we might want to think a bit more about the earliest um, indications of the emergence of uh, state uh, phobia and, and philia, which I think um, is much earlier actually than the French Revolution, but that's a discussion that emerges at the moment that the sovereignty of the state is uh, introduced. So this is a discussion that emerges uh, in the uh, late 16th century uh, with the work of Baudin and others. Um, where it is the sovereignty of the state that is at stake. And it is from that perspective, I think that you can um, make a couple of different distinctions in the ways in which people have uh, talked about uh, both the fear and also the love of the state. So if you, if you uh, look at it from this perspective, I would say that the first instance in the first mode of fear of the state is the state as an enforcer of religious uh, homogeneity and, and unity. The idea that the state is uh, an institution that in some way or another enforces uh, conformity in a mental sense. And that's a, it's a long tradition to start with religious conformity and religious unity, but um, in later phases, it's, it's, it's ideological, uh, the totalitarian state as an ideological state that enforces a certain uh, ideology. It is of course related to a second element there, namely the idea of arbitrary power, especially monarchical power as a form of subjective, uh, also personalized power. And in that sense, uh, the, the, the idea of the embodiment of the state in a ruler, something that I think turned up in the understanding of Alessandro Nye's uh, presentation, um, that is this idea of the subjectivity of the state as a ruler, the personality of the state as a ruler, and its arbitrariness is, I think, a second element in the fear and the, uh, and, the, and the hate also of the state as imposition of subjective arbitrary power. A third element, and that is the element that I think emerges already also in the, uh, in the 16th century, that is the state as an, as an, as an burdening institution, as sta uh, the state as a also as a bureaucracy, as a system of rule based on, um, uh, a, 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 on a hierarchy of, um, uh, of uh, bureaucrats who impose a certain set of, uh, of rules. And it is from that perspective that the problem of the state is, is not so much its arbitrariness as it is its formalism and its lack or distance from the true life. It's, it's imposing itself on the community of people who uh, live uh, uh, their own life and are subjected to this formalist power of the state. And then there are, I think, two other notions that uh, play a role here that both are, are related to the elite nature of the state. On the one hand, the state as, a, as the expression of class interest or the uh, interest of um, uh, 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 specific uh, uh, powers or initial interest within society, which is both a Marxist uh, argument, the, uh, the idea that the state is uh, uh, the expression of the power of the, of the ruling class, but it's, it's also a neoliberal argument, uh, the state as being captured by, um, by, by special interest. Um, and then finally, I think you have a, uh, an understanding of the state and also uh, the understanding of the state as expression of elite power, but then in a epistemological sense, the state as the rule of experts and expertise, and also the state 
it leads back perhaps to the first understanding, the state as controller of the minds of the people, saying what the people should think and how they should uh, reflect on their existence. Now, the important thing here is, is that all these images of the, these negative images of the state have their positive uh, mirror uh, image. So uh, versus the ideological and religious uh, homogeneity, you have the understanding of the state as an educational state, but also a state as a national state. It's the expression of the identity of a group of people, yeah? where uh, in fact these, this uniform, uniformity is seen as some, some kind of beneficial understanding. Uh, the idea of arbitrary power is supposed to the state as rule of law and a state that, that has tasked to, um, to limit uh, arbitrary power. If you have the idea of the state as a bureaucracy, uh, you have the op oppositional idea, which is, is, is equally uh, important, of uh, the state as a decentralized and local state, uh, closely interconnected with organizations within civil society as an uh, expression of the life of the people. The state as expression of class interest has its mirror image in, in the idea of the impartial state, the idea as the expression of a common good and also impartial in the sense that it creates fairness also through redistribution. And finally, the idea of the, ex the state of the experts, a state that controls knowledge in the minds of the people. You have, I think, the idea of the democratic state in which each individual within uh, that state has a right to co-determine uh, not just uh, its general will, but also to talk um, uh, about our interpretations of the world. So I think one of the um, crucial elements here is to see that the state philia and state phobia are concepts that are closely interconnected and that um, uh, at the same time, we must try to distinguish between the very various forms in which the state uh, uh, presents itself and also the various forms in which people identify and also disidentify with the state. That was not too long. That's uh, brilliant, uh, Ido. Well, we're a little bit over time. Uh, um, I think we've had a lot of uh, information uh, to, to process. Uh, I would like to thank all presenters for the wonderful and for the impossible task of presenting it in a very short uh, moment. It's very much a, a, a new style, uh, quick, uh, quick, uh, fast uh, science, I would say. But uh, the, of course, it would have been better to have much more time to discuss, but this is what it is for now. Uh, we're going to talk about with the other theme leaders about how to follow up and how to turn this perhaps in a little bit more uh, uh, enduring uh, form. But uh, I'll be glad to, to email you. And now after more than two hours of Zooming, I hope you go outside and enjoy the horrible gray weather. Uh, thanks once again for all the efforts and your wonderful uh, insights. And I'm going to get my uh, head clean now. So. Um, if there are no, no, not any, any urgent remarks, I would say uh, I'm going to end this uh, Zoom meeting. Also, thanks also, of course, to Marie Kofi of ACES for uh, her assistance as well and all others. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Matthias. Very interesting Bye. setup. Okay. Thanks Ciao. for organizing. Well, it's always yeah. what I like most. Yeah. Okay. See each other. Bye. Bye.